When I was younger, I was under the impression that Schindler's List is one of the more recent films to have been totally canonized as one of the absolute greatest of all time. I absolutely understand why this was the case, and I can... I think I can agree. I believe I do agree that this film was a was a tremendous masterpiece, if, if nothing else of the filmmaking form, although I feel as though it presents one of the more realistic character arcs, exercises in character development, least hackneyed in Hollywood filmmaking storytelling history. With the release of Jonathan Glazer's The Zone of Interest, I believe the um, perhaps somewhat morbid topic of Holocaust film, something of a almost a cynical endeavor to discuss these these pictures as entertainment rather than acts of remembrance. Well, e even documentary filmmaker Cloud Landsman, most well known for 1985's Shoah, he, he was not a fan of Schindler's List. In fact, a number of European filmmakers, including John Luke Goddard, I, I'm I'm fairly certain, didn't decried the film as as pornographic or gratuitous. Jiraj Hers claims one of the scenes, the, the infamous shower moment, is stolen from one of his films. I've not seen that particular film. It's from the 1980s. Who knows? I know Hers is a brilliant filmmaker. I've seen two or three of his works. Very, very impressive. From the 60s through to the 70s, I believe. In any instance, I feel as though Schindler's List more or less deserves all of the acclaim. The only gripe I might have with the film is there's only so much to truly learn about human evil but without reducing it to... The feature film experience is one wherein we watch the film, the film finishes, and we, we enter our back into the real world. And that phraseology is kind of the point slash problem. It's, it's not enough that the film starts and finishes and makes you feel as though you've learned something. I, I, I feel as though it's, it's more important that the film become a permanent fixture, uh, a permanent program with which that the brain interprets events henceforth. That would be the preferred goal of a film about a horrific genocidal event in history, such as the Nazi Holocaust. And so, does Schindler's List succeed in this? What it did do, I think, was bring the question of how this came about, why the Germans are willing to let this, this this atrocity occur. It brought that question into the forefront of the mainstream in a way that I, I think prior it had been relegated as this relic of history. It, it really enforced this idea that to understand uh, Landsman would, would claim that it would be hubris to try and understand those events, but to gain an idea of the cause and effect of these events, as Raoul Hilberg had, and Hilberg is not someone whom Landsman would decry. In fact, he's featured fairly prominently in the show, a documentary. There's this idea that when you understand, if you are willing to understand or oversee the events which took place, you can, un you can then potentially gauge where our societies can degrade and go wrong. Because it has been pointed out before, though we associate a nation shamed with, with a history of anti-Semitism as being Germany slash Poland now, in the 1930s this was not the case. The nation in Europe which had these accusations thrown toward it was France, especially after the Dreyfus Affair, and the place which was assumed to be a very, very dangerous one for the Jewish people was in fact Tsarist Russia. So what does that leave us with, with Schindler's List? How does it compare to the zone of interest? Well, what Schindler's List does with its black and white photography is it democratizes human events wherein it can, they can take place in an even, even playing field. If this Schindler's List had been in color, it would be 
to precisely uh, an historical event. Whereas, although we associate black and white footage with the quote, the past, unquote, the oh, quote, olden days, unquote, there's also something to be said for imagining the contemporary world in black and white. And then as a result, what we distill from Schindler's List, a film set in the 1940s in black and white, can be sooner related to the present than I, I, I suspect uh, if, if the film had been colorized. And that brings us to Citizen of Interest, which is in color, although infamously, this is the, the poignant novelty of the film, it, it does not show Auschwitz despite being situated right next door to it, literally. But what the zone of interest did that I think was so so bold was to was to employ a very contemporary you know, symmetrical indie slash festival aesthetic, something out of Wes Anderson even. I think there are accusations being thrown here that contemporary style chasing, scene chasing, the idea, trying to com conformity and sort of gauging and trying to ass assuage and conjure popularity and favor in general is kind of the breeding ground for nascent fascists. People, the people of Nazi Germany weren't born with these prejudices against it. They, they probably didn't think twice about Jews until Nazism became the dominant ideological force in, in Germany at that time. Afterward, they were very happy to dehumanize the other, the Jews, the Romani, uh, the mentally or physically disabled, whomever it might be, because it was, it was allowed, it was, it was encouraged by the culture, enforced, in fact, although in, in a capitalistic society, the line between, there, there are things which are not legally enforced, but which are kind of culturally enforced, and it may not guarantee jail time, but it can certainly guarantee a certain uh, cultural expulsion if one does not adhere to certain tenets. I appreciate that the zone of interest brought to light the the the, the genesis of, of of fascism within a, an otherwise a society of pleasure seekers, as I I I would not solely diagnose, but I, I don't see, at least the characters in the zone of interest are certainly, we can describe them as materialistic pleasure seekers sooner than we can describe them as spiritual patriots. Or, you know, it's not Germany that they like, it's the material luxuries that Germany provides them that they like. And now I feel as though it's it's a bit morbid to discuss the topic of films related to the Nazi Holocaust because it can potentially cheapen the the horrors of that genocide. And I think this is some of the some of the inspiration for why authors like Norman Finkelstein penned his infamous Holocaust industry text in I think I think that was published in two thousand. I'm gonna move on and discuss other best picture winners that I admire. Schindler's list is among the best of them in my opinion. One of the more impressive productions which Spielberg embarked upon possibly one of the five most impressive and I think of all of the films which can potentially be I don't think it is necessarily anymore but dismissed as a film which is too much a predictable exercise into the horrors of humanity's past and what we can learn from them in a very context which can be you know screened in schools or rented at the local video shop without it being you know too garish like or inaccessible to a, an average audience like Lansman's show was like the average holocaust documentary would be or like a film for like um lm klimov's come and see would be for example too extreme for for an average audience perhaps even though maybe one of these things ought to be shock the system you know we're going to move on and we're discussing next time a film which made a definite mockery of history although some people are okay with that and some people well it's a film that's joked about a lot and a film that was seriously critiqued at the time to some degree still is although more from uh, film snobs say than certainly from mainstream audiences 
What might that film be? Well, we'll find out next time. AOD has some interesting thoughts on that one.